Heavenly Father, once again, we just thank you, Father, that we can come here today before your presence as an assembly of baptised believers. Father, we just pray that you will help us just leave this wicked world outside and whatever is troubling us or, or wearing us, dear Lord, or wearing us down, that we can address that, dear Lord, within this hour of just studying with you and, and sitting at your feet. Father, we just pray that you'll show us your ways and not our own ways, Lord, but your ways. And help us, Lord, not to be weary or to faint in due season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we see a lot of people fainting. And I hear countless stories, countless stories of, of people who were once in the faith, once going to church, just give it up. I think we were talking about that last week in that Zoom meeting as well. I think just people just decide, oh, this is not for me anymore and just walk straight away. You know, for people like that, you've got to wonder, were they really saved in the first place? Well, I don't know. I can't take that axe to the root of that tree, just like John the Baptist couldn't. But today, we've got lots of people leaving churches everywhere, Baptist churches, all sorts of churches are becoming a thing of the past because people are getting weary. We're getting tired. You know, we're in a fight. We're in a spiritual fight in this world, and, and we are getting tired so today's sermon is, be not weary in well-doing. Be not weary in well-doing. Last week we saw, um, we saw that um, charity, unconditional love that we are to have for those around us. So we're sort of going to follow on from there. Be not weary in well-doing. In Galatians 6, 9 it says here, we have a promise from the Lord here related to our service for Him or our ministry in this church and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not so this morning i want to look at these and focus on these two words weary and faint weary and faint you know it is common for dedicated christians to experience these symptoms from time to time i know i do i do sometimes we get weary and we think What's the use? Why are we going on? But there is a reason. And Satan wants to take you down. Make no mistake. He wants to take you down so that you are presented useless in the service of the Lord. So weary and faint. And, uh, faint. 2 Corinthians 12, 27 says this, and this is Paul in recounting the story of his life. In weariness... In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Now this was a physical weariness that Paul went through. He went through all these trials and tribulations, but this is a physical weariness. But something I want to concentrate on this morning is that there is also a mental weariness. A mental weariness. Turn up, please, to Hebrews 12.3. Hebrews 12.3. In Hebrews 12.3, it says this, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, Christ, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Wearied and faint in your minds. So your mind can become wearied and you can faint. Now these experiences usually end up in discouragement. Discouragement. Discouragement means to lose courage. Discourage. You've lost courage. You're not fighting the fight. Discouragement can cause a change in our attitude and our actions. This is what being weary in the mind does, or fainting in the mind. Discouragement affects your home life, your church ministries, and your walk with the Lord. This is how discouragement can affect you, and it can affect me. None of us are exempt. None of us, as mere mortals, if I could say that, are exempt from this. Lest ye faint in your mind. You see, the battleground is your mind. 
That's where your battle is this morning, is with your mind. God's people can and do experience discouragement. No one is immune. The classic example of this is seen in Numbers 13, 30 to 33, and I'll just read this out for you. Turn there if you wish, Numbers 13, 30 to 33. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. This is the land of Canaan, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. You see, they, they looked at what was in front of them instead of looking to Christ. They looked by seeing. They saw and they fainted in their minds. Now these giants weren't some half-bred Nephilim come mankind. That's a load of garbage and I'll tell it to your face right now. Just forget that. There is no such thing as angels coming down from heaven mating with females. Angels are spirit beings. And the Bible also says that we shall be like them, neither male or female, when we're in heaven. Nephilim is just another word for giant. That's how the King James presents it to you, as giants. Big men. And King David and the rest made sure that not only Goliath died, but all his brothers died too. They went after him, they killed a lot. There are no more giants once they were killed. Yes, we get big men today. Dan Farrell, six foot six. People are six foot seven, some are seven foot. Well, that's just the way, it's just their, their genetics. It's just rubbish when people say that people, that angels came down, or the demons came down, sorry, and bred with them. Well, somehow they miraculously had genitals when they got here. Okay? It doesn't work that way. They're spirit beings. It's a load of garbage. But I hear it all the time. But that's okay. That's a side issue. But notice the exaggeration of these men. We are as grasshoppers. We're small in this world. We can't do this, Moses. We can't do it. And we're not going to do it. You see, this is how discouragement comes and affects you. It affects your mind. It affects your mind. The problem with discouragement is that it is contagious. Some people have been sick lately with this flu. And even, I, I, um, whatever we call it, what do we call it when you get a picture of the eyes? Conjunctivitis. It's contagious. Conjunctiv yeah, conjunctivitis is contagious. And so is discouragement. It's contagious. Someone will walk into a church with their chin jagging on the ground and all of a sudden it's contagious and it's spread through us all. And yet we've got this blessed hope that we're waiting for at the rapture. We know where we're going when we die. But yet, we still like to drag our knuckles on the ground and our chins and feel sorry for ourselves because we've taken our eyes off Christ. This is what discouragement does. And 40 years later, Moses recounted the episode. 40 years of living in the wilderness, not being blessed by God, being fed but even that they murmured against, the manna and the quail. It says here in Deuteronomy 1, 27 to 28, and this is 40 years later, And ye murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the world, to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Sometimes we wonder why the Lord leads us here. There's a sermon coming on that. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren, it says, have discouraged our heart. Think on that. Our brethren have discouraged us. We've got to be careful of this, this disease of discouragement that can come into a church. 
you know, we're hoping to start this, this new format next month and we're hoping to start, to start with Sunday school and let's pray that it grows from there. But let's not be discouraged about it when it starts. And yes, it is more work. That's what I think about, more work, another job to do. But if we share it, it's not so hard. And we need to build each other up, to exhort each other. The day is coming when there will be a reconciliation with Christ our Saviour. But our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying, The people is greater and taller than we, the cities are great and walled up to heaven, and moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. What a gross exaggeration. Their, their walls go up to heaven. See, that's what happens in discouragement. We exaggerate our predicaments. Oh, woe is me, the world is against me. Don't we say that? I say that. And the Lord generally quickly rebukes me. Discouragement stops or impedes any progress. Any progress in our marriage or marriages. That's what discouragement can do. It can impede your marriage because you're discouraged with it for some reason. Or it impedes progress in your family because you're all discouraged. And also in your ministry for the Lord, whether it's playing music, whether it's teaching Sunday school, whether it's preaching, whether it's leading music, whatever the case may be. The Word of God says in Deuteronomy 1, 2 to 3, There are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel, according unto all that the Lord had given him in a commandment unto them. They were originally only 11 days journey from Canaan, from the promised land. And it took them 40 years to get there. That's what discouragement does, brethren. It impedes our growth. It impedes bringing those who are lost to Christ. Discouragement is a disease and it will do its job if we let it. We need the great physician here to heal us. Our brethren have discouraged our heart. Let's turn to 1 Kings, please, for our first Bible reading this morning. 1 Kings. 1 Kings. I did mark it. 1 Kings chapter 19. It's a familiar story, or account, I should say, sorry. A familiar account. We'll read verses 1 to 8 of 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19. And this is a classic example of when discouragement leads to depression. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. He did. He butchered them. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. And when he saw, get that, look at that word, and when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. I've had enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and he looked. And beheld, there was a cake, bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. So when does discouragement often strike? When does discouragement often strike? 
From this account, we see that discouragement often comes after a spiritual victory. After you've been victorious in something with God, after a spiritual victory, just like Elijah had on Mount Carmel. So beware. Elijah went from a mountaintop victory on Mount Carmel to a juniper tree in the wilderness, feeling sorry for himself. So he had this great victory. And then because he saw what was in front of him that was going to happen to him, he became afraid of not trusting God. This is the sin of unbelief. And so he, he goes to this juniper tree, as we see in verse 4. Valleys follow mountaintops. Valleys follow mountaintops. When you have that experience with God, when you've just led someone to the Lord maybe, expect Satan to strike. And he will. He will strike. There's nothing quite like leading someone to the Lord. Nothing quite like it. As far as I'm concerned, there is no hardly any experience on earth that is better than that, knowing that you have just saved a soul from hell. He that is wise saves souls. What Proverbs verse is that? He that is wise saves souls. It is wise to be out there witnessing, trying to lead someone to Christ. But valleys follow mountaintops. We'll just go through a bit of a list here. Noah. Noah, remember Noah. He was delivered from the flood and yet his valley to drunkenness in the new world. He was a righteous man. He was a preacher. And he was one that made it on the boat. But yet his valley was drunkenness in the new world. Abram, his mountaintop, faith journey to Canaan. What was his valley? A famine-forced journey to Egypt. That was Abram's valley. Moses, God's provision of water from a rock. What was his valley? To anger and striking the rock. All he had to do was to speak to that rock. But because he was provoked, as we saw last week, he was provoked, he hit the rock. But God told him not to do that. He told him just to speak to it. So Moses disobeyed God and he suffered for that. He didn't make it into the promised land. And sometimes we don't make it into the promised land, so to speak, even in this life, when we disobey God in unbelief. The Israelites, God's power in the Egyptian exodus. Can you just place your mind in trying to imagine, not that we like using that word much, but place your mind back to what it was like. They got all these gifts, all these, all these precious stones and gold and everything else off the Egyptians. They gave it to them. They get to the water's edge. The Egyptians decide, oh no, we're coming after them again. God splits the waters. They walk on dry ground, dry ground, not mud, dry ground to the other side. The waters come back over and drowns and kills everyone there. But yet, all that, they were wandering in the desert for 40 years, in the wilderness. That was their valley. The sin of unbelief. Wow. You and I think that if we were there, that wouldn't have happened. No, wouldn't it? There is only two. It was Caleb and Joshua. They were the only two out of those, those other men, the spies that went there. They all folded when they saw it was only Caleb and Joshua. And they were the only two that went in the promised land, by the way. And everyone over under the age of 21. Wow. What a valley to go through. 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And yet that's what we see with people today. They won't trust Christ. They won't believe him that he will help them in their daily lives. So they wander around in desperation, in misery. They're up one minute, down the next. Up one minute, down the next in their feelings. You're just not trusting Christ. I don't know why you don't. Sometimes I don't know why I don't. It's our nature. It's our human paradigm. We tend to want to 
think that we've got to work for it. We don't. We just come to Christ and we're saved. He's already there. And you cannot escape him. And he won't leave you. He won't leave you. I just don't get it. But it happened with Israel. I think we would have done the same thing. Joshua. Great faith victory at Jericho. The walls of Jericho fell down. Collapsed. The place was ransacked and looted and and God's judgment came upon it. But yet they had a prayerless defeat at Ai. They only sent a few people. I think they only sent 3,000 people to fight, to fight the enemy there. And they got their backsides whipped. They were chased all across the country to the sea. Because not all the people went. They only sent some. We don't need to be all involved in this. They were all involved at Jericho. But all of Israel was not involved at Ai. And they got their backsides whipped, good and proper. Wow, what a valley. Peter, Peter, the Apostle Peter, thou art the Christ. To I know not the man. Wow, what a valley. To say to Christ and even looking into his eyes, I don't know him. That is a valley. Thou art the Christ, to I know not the man. And Christ looked into his eyes. And that's when he, when he realized his sinfulness and his unbelief. And brothers and sisters, any of us can fall into this. Take heed to yourselves. Any of us can fall into this trap of discouragement. John, behold the Lamb of God. This is John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God. And what was his valley? Do we look at Art thou the Christ? Even he had a low point. But yet he was the greatest man born of a woman. It happens to any of us. It can afflict any of us. And then Christ himself. In Matthew 3, we see his baptism in doing that which was right, to fulfill all righteousness. To the next chapter in Matthew 4, to his temptation. That was his valley. But he succeeded. Is it not written? Satan was defeated and left him. But that was Christ's valley. For the believer, a valley may come soon after. It may come soon after getting saved. The doubts that you may have, the ridicule from family members or the rejections of others. I know many here, many I've spoken to, have been ridiculed by their family. They've come to know the Lord. And they try to tell their mothers and fathers, hey, this is Christ, this is the Christ, this is the way to eternal life. And they're just ridiculed, mocked. See, that could be your valley. I know after I got saved, I was only seven. But about a week later, I, I started having doubts. So I went to my mum. I said, mum, am I, I have these doubts, am I saved? She goes, yes, son, <laughs> you're saved. If you generally repented of your sins and asked Christ to forgive you, you were saved. There and then. Because you cannot lose it. Otherwise, his blood is insufficient. He's insufficient for you and it's insufficient for me. But it's not. If one drop of his blood was to hit hell right now, all the flames would just go out. It's that powerful. But discouragement. We can be discouraged by the way we feel. Maybe it's when we sin, we feel discouraged. Can I truly be saved? Yes. You just need to ask for forgiveness for that sin and move on. Don't live in the depression of just being a sinner by nature. Maybe it'll come after you've been baptised. You know, this is a public identification of Jesus Christ. But not long after that, maybe once again you'll be ridiculed for that. Why did you do that? Oh, because the Lord instructs us to. Yes, but you can be baptised by just anybody. No, you can't. It's got to be of the baptism of John. And it's got to be through the Lord's, one of the Lord's churches, one of his institutions, not one of man's. Man has no right to be baptised in, in Jesus' name unless they have authority. Authority comes from a church of baptised believers who belong to that church, who are members. This is a scriptural way. Read it. If you don't believe it, then you haven't read. This is what Christ has said. Have you not read to Satan? 
Have you not read? When I see people that don't understand this, look, and, and I'm all, all, all for having a dis- talk and a discussion about these things, but I've been through this time and time and time again. I go to the position when I'm studying for, for the sermon or whatever, and I put myself in somebody else's shoes to try and understand where they're coming from. So I go through their proof text and I read them and I look at scripture and say, that's out of context. You cannot be right. You cannot be right. I went through this again with tongue speaking, with verse um, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. I put myself in their shoes. Okay, show me where it's biblical. He couldn't. The commentator couldn't. One minute he's quoting Spurgeon and, and Rice and a heap of other godly men and then all of a sudden he goes to somebody else who agrees with his way of thinking. And this is where we've got to be careful when we're on the internet because we can be led into bad doctrine. Just be careful. If it doesn't align with scripture, throw it out. That's what I've always done. And there's something stumping me, I just take time out and say, Lord, I'm not sure in this, please show me. And he does. One particular, one particular subject took about three years before it finally got through. Ah, that's it. There you go, thank you. And it was just a little line that somebody had written in the future about those in Joel chapter 2, that great army, who it was. And it turned out of the us. The saved, when we come with Christ in Revelation 19 to conquer the earth. That great army's us. It's not some AI produced army that no one knows about and I've heard people say this of Joel too. Read it. Understand it. The people on horses are the same people on the horses in, Rome, in, in Revelation 19. But a valley may come soon after. I'll get back on topic, sorry. Maybe it's surrendering to God's will. Maybe it's a call to preach. But you go through a valley. Maybe it's winning a soul to Christ, as I said before, and then afterwards. Satan will try and defeat you. Or maybe it's just simply taking a stand for the truth and someone will oppose you vehemently and you go through a valley. A valley. It can happen to every one of us. What is the root cause of most discouragement? Discouragement is often the result of having a wrong focus. You see that in 1 Kings 19.3, and we mentioned this word before, when he saw, see Elijah had the wrong focus on these things. The ten spies looked at the giants. Joshua and Caleb looked at the Lord. Elijah looked at the threat, but Joshua and Caleb looked to the Lord in belief. You see, perspective is so important. And this is why faithful church attendance is so vital. In Hebrews 10.25 it says here, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as ye see the day approaching. Exhorting one another. This helps with discouragement. You see, we build each other up. If you're, if you're a person who just doesn't want to go to church because you've been hurt by someone in the church and you don't go to church, well, who exhorts you? You need to get back to church to be exhorted by the brethren in the faith. We need fellowship. Acts 28, 15. And on here, Paul was on his way to Rome. In Acts 28, 15. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appi Forum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. He took courage with the brethren. This is what builds us up, guys. It's each other. Each other as we exhort each other, as we see the day approaching. And not... Forgetting the assembling of ourselves together. We need to assemble. We take courage from each other. Remember Hebrews 12, 3. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. 
your mind. Your mind is a battlefield and that's where Satan will lob all his hand grenades at you. Your mind. Your mind. The mind is a battlefield or the control centre for the, for the Christian life. And indeed, Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So is he. As he thinks, as you think in your mind. Discouragement can come when serving or living for the Lord is difficult. And sometimes we find it difficult, don't we? I think we could nod and say, yes, thank you. We can. Life does become difficult in our service for the Lord. Numbers 21.4 says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. You see, your way in serving the Lord can also lead you to discouragement when things happen. All sorts of little things are thrown in. It's like throwing a spanner into the works and the whole cogs stop. Has that ever happened to anyone? It happened to me once at a guillotine. I nearly lost my life. It was an older guillotine. This is a paper guillotine. And it jammed. So I get there with a screwdriver. There's a couple of cogs I can see that need shifting. So it's belt, belt, belt. And something went wrong, but the big screwdriver just went straight up by that much. I don't think I told you that, did I? No, <laughs> that was a close one. A spanner can be thrown into the works and it can take you out. It can take you out. And it hit the ceiling and it made a horrible noise. It went quick. That was almost my appointed time. Almost. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Elijah thought karma would have ended the wickedness in Israel. And sometimes we think that when we give the word of God to someone, especially a loved one, we think that should, should end their wickedness in their life. But it doesn't always work out that way. We've got to keep in prayer. Keep speaking. Words are like apples of gold in pitchers of silver. Keep talking, keep speaking. But do it out of love unconditional love but for Elijah and it may be for you too once you give someone the word of God now it seems that Carmel only stirred up the wickedness when you speak to someone it could be a family member it seems to stir them up and they get angry with you they get upset they do that's what happened to Elijah he thought this this great Carmel experience this mountaintop and he slew all those prophets but yet he had a valley. He had a valley. He thought, this will do it. This will be, be national revival. And it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. We put out all those, we did all the letterbox in Wang when Dan Farrell came over. Two. Out of 7,000 flyers, two. That's okay. Just being faithful. Put it out there. It's up to the Holy Spirit to bring, to draw people in. But did it get me down? No. We were faithful. That's all we got to be, is faithful. Don't worry about what others are doing. Just be faithful. Just be, don't worry about someone swearing at you because they've given you the word, because you've given them the word of God. Just be faithful. Don't be worried about the ridicule. Just be faithful. It's God that leads people to himself. And it's the Lord that will build his churches. He just loves us so much to have us involved. To bring him glory. We can become disappointed sometimes with what God is doing. And notice in verse 4 of, of chapter 19 of 1 Kings, note his prideful attitude here. The words, For I am not better than my father's. For pretty much saying, I'm no better off. In other words, he thought of himself a little bit more highly than he should have. And now he's saying, well, I've done all this, I'm no better off than them. There's a bit of pride in his heart as well. And that's what we mentioned last week, pride of grace. We think we got it all, we think we know it all. And we look down on other people, no, 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 no. 
there's a lot of other people out there who do not belong to the Lord's churches that I expect will be higher than I in the kingdom of God. God is righteous. He'll do what is right for each and every one of us where he puts us in his kingdom in eternity. He'll do what's right. But we will be rewarded more than what we're worth. More than what any of us are worth. Praise God for his goodness and his love. But we see here that he was in pride. He was proud. The prophet Jeremiah also struggled with this. In Jeremiah 12, 1, he asked, why? He asked God, why? It says here, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee. Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are they all they happy that deal very treacherously. Why? What's going on, he's asking. So how should discouragement and depression be addressed? How should we address this? It is important that we deal with discouragement within ourselves and also with others. If you see someone who's, who's um, depressed, discouraged, help them. See, we are to exhort one another. Why? Because discouragement can have a detrimental effect, just like it did on the Israelites. A journey of 11 days now takes them 40 years. People in their Christian lives can be impeded in their growth through discouragement. And it could be for a lot of reasons. And I don't think I need to list them out. I don't think we have enough time. Elijah wanted to quit when he said, it is enough, I quit, I've had enough. Jeremiah wanted to know, excuse me, wanted to throw in the towel in Jeremiah 20, verses 8 to 9. He wanted to throw it in. The Word of God says in that section of Scripture, For since I spake, I cried out, this is Jeremiah, I cried violence and spoil, because the Word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. In other words, he spoke the truth against the world and the world mocked him back. He became a reproach. His name became a byword. And he was derided for that. And indeed, when you're speaking to some family members or some friends about Christ, they will deride you and you will feel like a reproach. You've been reproached. Then I said in verse 9, I will not make mention of him. In other words, I'm not going to mention God anymore, nor speak any more in his name. No, I quit. Done. This is what Jeremiah the prophet went through. And he was a great prophet. But... We see this word, but. His word was in mine heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary, get that word, I was weary with forbearing, but I could not stay. In other words, he had to keep preaching the word. And brethren, this is where each and every one of us must be today. Not be weary, don't forbear, keep preaching the word. Keep reaching out to that lost person. Keep reaching out to your lost relative. Whatever the situation may be, keep reaching out. Don't be discouraged. God is doing the work. You're just relaying the message because they're not going to turn up the Bible. Why would they? They've got so much in this world to keep them entertained. We've got phones, we've got computers, we've got sport on Sundays now. Heaven above, we weren't even allowed to shoot on a Sunday when I was a kid, let alone go shopping. Forget that. Or playing sport, no way. But you see how over time people become discouraged with the way things were. And over time it's been whittled away and here we are today. Anything goes. You could be an alphabet person. LGBTQI+. You can be something like that. Dress how you want. Oh my goodness. We have gone down so far. So far. As a society. And yet we can become discouraged with that. But no. What did Jesus say? These things must come to pass. They must. Have joy in the Lord. Have your faith in God. Have your assurance in Christ. You do not need to be discouraged with what's going on. But poor Jeremiah, that's the way he felt. I love Jeremiah. He was, even, he was even thrown in a pit and yet he had to do a 
a, um, a land transaction with his nephew, I think it was, and he was in a pit. And he's dealing of selling his farm or, or parcel of the land that he had. How would that be? Thrown in a pit, but yet still being able to conduct business. The poor guy. But, he said, I could not stay and neither should we. When we have this truth within our hearts, when we have salvation within our hearts, when our souls are saved forever, we cannot forbear. We need to tell people of the good news of Jesus Christ. So it's okay or not wrong to feel this way from time to time. But the trick is not to stay there. Just don't stay there. It comes in me from time to time. I just don't stay there. The Lord normally just gives a bit of a slap around. Or Julie gives me a slap around. <laughs> and I wake up to myself and say, okay, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> More times than not. The Lord cares for us when we are discouraged. You can see this in verses 5 to 6 of 1 Kings 19. He took care of him. Elijah was discouraged, but God took care of him. Did he let him starve to death? No, he fed him. Cruise of water and, and cakes baked on coals. He fed him. And the evening he sent an angel to touch him and said, Arise, take and eat, for your journey is too great for you. 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I memorised that one when I was a kid. Not long after I got saved. I memorised that verse. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Hebrews 13, 5 to 6 says this, He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, get that, boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That should be our verse to this present distress that this world is in. We may boldly say, boldly. Psalm 55, 22, it says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. See, he will take care of you when you're discouraged. He will take care of you. You just need to believe that he will and trust him and submit to his will. God will use times of discouragement to benefit us, but only if we allow him. If we fight against this whatever is discouraging and don't trust him for the answer, then he can't use us to help us. See, it can build us up. It can benefit us. So we need to notice how the Lord ministered to his prophet, Elijah. First, there was action. The Lord provided Elijah food and rest. Second action, the Lord asked a searching question. And it wasn't how do you feel, it was how are you doing? What are you doing? Not how do you feel, what are you doing? So it's not how you feel, it's about what are you doing? That was the second action. You know, in times of discouragement, we must take stock of what we are or are not doing. It's about doing, not about how you feel. What are you doing? Verse 9, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? It's not, How do you feel, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? Your feelings will be up one minute and down the next. What are you doing here? Third action, the Lord took him to Mount Horeb. Now, discouragement is the time we must get into the Word of God, the Mount of God. When you're discouraged, here it is, <laughs> Mount Horeb, the Mount of God. Read it, believe it, trust it, if it's King James Bible. You will get growth out of this book. The others you will not. Would you prefer to drink muddy water? or clean water. I use that example in, over in Ghana. I put a clean water there and I put a glass of muddy water there. And it got through straight away. If they can believe it, why can't we? What would you prefer? Clean water or muddy water? 
the muddy water won't make you sick unless it's got a parasite in it. The clean water, that's the water I want to use, the King James Bible. You will get growth out of the King James Bible. The fourth action, Elijah was given a fresh revelation of God in verses 11 to 12. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces and rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, a still, small voice. Once we get our eyes back on who is important, he will deal with us. And that's the doing. Get your eyes, what you see, back onto who is important. And that's Christ. In other words, you need to listen to that still small voice. And you will only get it by reading the Word of God. You won't get it any other way, brethren. Man's ways will just put band-aid solutions onto the problems in your life. You may succeed for a while to get your drug addiction and everything else or whatever sin that's besetting you, but only this can fix you for good. That still, small voice. The fifth and final action, and we're coming to a close soon, the Lord then refocused the prophet in verses 15, 16 and 18. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return thy way. He said, Go. And that's exactly what we've got to do in our commandment, the Great Commission. He said to go. And once again, we see here in the Old Testament, the Lord is telling Elijah, Go. Return on the way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel uh, to be king over Syria. And verse 18, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he was to go. And there were 7,000 others. In other words, you're not the only one who goes through discouragement. But there are 7,000 others that had not served Baal in this situation. 7,000. It's probably not a lot out of a whole nation of I'm not quite sure how many million there would have been at that time. But what the Lord did to him here was to focus him on the reality. The reality. Not some fictional idea from your imagination or from somebody's imagination on Facebook, YouTube or whatever. On reality. Reality. The reality is we're not the only group of Christians here who was saved on their way to heaven. Whether one of the Lord's churches or not, talking the family of God. We're not the only ones. We're not the only ones to get discouraged from time to time. But if we do get discouraged, we're going to impede the growth of this church, brethren. We will. If we get discouraged, if we don't look at the big picture, if we don't keep our focus on the job, the church will die. This is one of the Lord's churches. I don't want that. I'm sure you don't want it either. There are unsaved souls out there that the Lord can bring in. And he needs his institution here in Wangaratta to be able to bring them somewhere to where they're fed the pure word of God in its purity. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged, brothers and sisters, in, in what this world is saying about us or what family members may be saying about you, or because we're not a huge church with a heap of cars out the front, hey, there's plenty to park. Maybe the Lord's got plans. Maybe he needs faithful people to faithfully come every Sunday to put their hand up and say, yes, I'll help there. I can do that. That's all we need. And that's all we need to do. But we can become much discouraged if brethren can do that to us. We have the examples in the Bible. Let's pray today that we will be an encouragement to everybody. And I'm not saying that everybody has or wants to do everything in a church. I understand that. 
But sometimes a gift is something that we're not even good at. <laughs> like riding a push bike. Ben wasn't good at riding his push bike when he was how old? Three. Until I got him on the side of a hill, mounted him on it and pushed him down. <laughs> he stopped before the fence. <laughs> even though I was getting a little worried. But he stopped before the fence. But after that, he had the gift of riding a push bike. <laughs> and he could ride it. We've just got to throw ourselves into the deep end, brethren, at times and just submit. We've just got to submit to the word of the Lord and to his ways. And let him deal with us. If you're discouraged this week because of something that's happened all this month or what the world's going through and you get all this information on your phone, that's okay. But don't stay there. These things must come to pass. But the end's not yet. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you, Lord, for your words this morning. And as harsh they may be, Lord, to us all, and I find them quite harsh as well, Lord, because it, it pokes the finger at my inability and my, and my sinful nature. Lord, we just pray that you'll work in our hearts and especially our minds, Father, because that's where Satan wants to defeat us. Work in our minds, Lord, that wonderful work that only, you can, that only you can bring. And bring us, Lord, to the foot of the cross in humble submission just to serve you, Father, in whatever capacity it may be in this church or even out into the wider community, Lord, as we seek and love those who need to hear the gospel, Father. May people see your face in ours when we speak to people in a genuine, unconditionally loving way. Once again, Lord, we just thank you for today and it will bring us back at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.